I think I've always been fascinated by depictions and images of hell. Um, I mean, Dante's Inferno is in a fascinating one. And then, you know, in the 90s, there was Buffy, who was always, you know, battling off demons, breaking through the hell mouth. What I knew about it was from movies and from comic books and from how it's just kind of baked into our culture. Probably my first sort of exposure to the concept of hell probably came from a cartoon, like probably came from Hercules. And of course, the devil with in the red leotard and the horn and the pitchfork <laughs> was there and just like sticking people. <laughs> that old teaching of, you know, the devil, well, he doesn't have feet, he, he has hooves, you know, and he has horns and he has a tail. He always has a tail. For me, he was like the hell CFO or CEO or something. I think I felt like hell was more of a Hollywood kind of version of it. Like there was like smashing of teeth and, <laughs> and like, I um, pictured a lot of lava spraying up at me. I just remember teeth gnashing, and that was just like stuck in my head about like how horrible hell is supposed to be. The rapture and the mark of the beast, etc. Human beings are, are really interested in things that are dark and scary and weird. I started telling my school friends very dark, creepy stories about hell, the way other kids would tell each other ghost stories. And it got to the point where I was scaring them and their moms had to start calling my mom to say, Shandy can't tell our kids about hell anymore because they're having nightmares and they're terrified now. And who knows what the hell hell is or who knows what heaven is really. I think when I was very young, certainly it was a physical place. Like everything was very concrete, but Sort of as I got older, I don't know that I saw it so much as a physical place, as more of a, a just a state of torment. Yeah, I think I did picture it as a, a a real place, whether it was physical or kind of spiritual. Um, if I can even distinguish between those things, like it was this place that that some part of me would end up, um, and it would either rotate between like this just darkness and kind of just dark loneliness or like pure fire and torment, which feel very much the same. I don't know if it's because I grew up like a privileged, cis, straight, white guy on the prairies, but in the United Church of Canada, hell didn't seem to be a central focus of my religious upbringing. So I've been thinking a lot about the difference between things you teach on purpose and things you teach by accident. So on purpose, I learned that hell is a place that you go if you're not in relationship with God through Jesus. Um, various, you know, images of eternal damnation, pretty scary stuff for a little person. Um, and then later, the part that I don't think was explicit, but I picked up on is a thing that keeps you from God can be anything from having sex outside of marriage to not like believing properly. Not that I ever really figured out what that was. And things like leading a quote-unquote homosexual lifestyle. So I grew up certainly believing that uh, hell was a literal place you went where you were separated from God for eternity. And uh, yeah, that was, that was really scary for me. That caused probably my greatest crisis of faith in my life. I think it wasn't an uncommon belief at that time that that hell actually existed and that uh, people went there. I also have a, a very personal story of my uh, my mother died when I was six and uh, she was raised Baptist in a very strict family and uh, she took her own life. Uh, so uh, that scared me tremendously because I thought um, growing up that my, my mother, I would be separated from my mother um, because she, uh, she, because she, um, completed suicide uh, was going to help. That's what I believed. It's it's weird to imagine what my actual conception of it was. I I knew about it as a concept, like here's what's happening to you if you don't do this and you you know go off the straight and narrow. You do bad things. Uh, that's you know you know you you will be punished. You know you'll go to hell. You know and 
I guess growing up, that's probably also what my 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 grandparents and my parents have have learned. I think I went to Billy Graham Crusade or something like that with them, or and he. Uh, so that that's kind of where I first heard this whole idea that uh, that somehow there was a a, a grand judgment that uh, and you. Uh, I think Billy Graham's line is basically the two things you'd be assured of. One of them is that you're going to die, and the other one is you're going to be judged. And you're going to go one way or the other. There's really only two choices. Um, but, you know, Paul also says, you know, when I was a child, yeah, I spoke like a child, but now I'm an adult. So I put away those childish things. And I think part of those childish things that we put away aren't just behaviors. They're also knowing that things need more consideration. Things are deeper than what we were taught, so they shouldn't be taken so lightly. So the book of Revelation um, is this book that has captured the popular imagination, right? So so that, you know, um, it's it's not only in church culture, it's also in secular culture. Um, the book of Revelation is not written to be a roadmap of heaven or hell. The book of Revelation is rather a kind of literature that is using literary devices to persuade people to act and live in particular kinds of ways. It is a pretty heavy um, anti-Roman uh, screed about the dangers of mixing politics and religion. That's one. Um, that Empires eventually fall, and to not put our uh, not put our trust in any one particular polit political system, and that really ult ultimately uh, ultimately God is uh, God is in control. How is deeply connected to empire religion, in my opinion, because um, how you know how how is a tool to keep. Um, groups in subjugation and empire is all about hierarchy and there's always somebody in and somebody out and so hell is a, a perfect tool of subjugation hell has been used as a way to control people to make people do things that maybe they don't agree with or um, that they don't want to it was used as a very strong shaming tool um, especially in my household um, fear is the opposite of faith, um, and you know we're we're allowed we're allowed to have we're allowed to have doubts, but to be scared into the faith is not faith at all. For someone who is telling you that you're going to hell for an action, what are the reasons that they state are are putting you into a, a like what? What? What objective is that person trying to fulfill for themselves? And what are what are the moral objectives of that person who are telling you that your your mortal soul is in jeopardy? Um, because I think that you'll you'll find that there's very little that they're trying to accomplish for you and your soul as a person. Um, I think I've always been suspicious of of a strong emphasis on hell because I've been suspicious of the idea that you should believe in God to avoid going to hell. That seems to me to be more motivated by self-interest than it is to be motivated by the love of God. The 19th century was a huge time when this concept of hell really got reinforced. And then we think it's always been there in Christianity. But if you go back to the Bible, I mean, anything that Jesus spoke of, he was pointing to how we live this life and how we live this life with compassion for those who are most vulnerable, for those who are excluded by society. If you don't transform your pain, you're going to transmit it. And I often think of that. It's like, okay, if you're operating from a place of fear, uh, and certainly many of us who came from evangelical backgrounds, like it's so fear-based, you're going to transmit that pain. You're going to introduce others to it. Like it's, it, That's just going to happen. Um, but once you can kind of identify it, yeah, it loses its power. You know, Psalm 139, God has chosen us in the womb, knows us in the womb. God knows who we are, all of who we are in ways that we don't even know ourselves. I knew that uh, around 13, I was, I was 
gay, so I knew that that was going to be difficult. That was probably one of the bigger sins that I grew up with knowing. Um, so I just, I came to a point maybe when I was in my early 20s then. Um, so I think like in my teen years, I was kind of struggling with that. And once I got to my early 20s, um, like my mind had to make a decision. Like I, I couldn't hate myself for who I was. There's been this long tradition in the Western tradition in which religion has been used to um, condemn and to other people who are queer. Uh, that is not who God is. God is not one who is interested in sending people into eternal torment for simply being who they are. It has never made sense to me, even as a kid, that queerness equals sin. Most of the Bible celebrates diversity in terms of how LGBTQ people have been disenfranchised from the church and by others. They have become a vulnerable group. So where is God's love a present with that vulnerable group? Well, it's shown in how I as an individual, how we as individuals and as organizations react to people that we see who are vulnerable. Some of the things that I've seen throughout my studies is just there's so many interpretations that have been so lost. Uh, and then when you look back at the original language or even just the context in which they're written in, it is completely opposite than what I've read in English um, or that I was taught in school. And so those those little nitty gritty things about language are really small, um, but they unfortunately have huge impacts on the lives of folks who either believe in hell or for queer folks like like us, where we, you know, we're um, stuck in this society, Christian society, that tells us that we're going to hell um, because of some failed uh, interpretations and failed translations of certain languages. The contextual understanding of, of these passages in the Bible that are bully, bully verses. I mean, are there some there that, that uh, you know, are there passages there uh, that are uh, less than helpful? Yes, there are. You know, we, and we we do have to acknowledge that, but at, but at the same at the same time, there's many 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 more images of of God's love and affirming people for who they are. It seems like hell is an incredibly unproportional punishment <laughs> for <laughs> sin on earth. You know, now that I'm a parent. I mean, I just don't see there ever being anything that could happen that would make me not love my kids. And so it just makes sense to me that, um, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, rather than resort to this idea that some of us are going to heaven and some of us are going to hell, how about we, we think about God's kingdom, God's kingdom, um, uh, as a communal kind of uh, hope that we can look forward to that that won't leave us all behind. You know? If God is love, how can the door be closed? How can the gates be shut? Like, we, we have to... The, grace can't be a one-time offer. Grace has to be this perpetual second chance. I cannot believe that God would allow anybody to be separated from God. So, because I think God's greatest desire is for us to be united. And if I understand God to be love, and if I understand Jesus' message to be one of love, then fear and love, they're opposites. Then, then a theology rooted in fear is not a theology rooted in God, if God is a God of love. If, if the point of hell is to say, there are things that are unjust, and unrighteous in our world. And there are things that are just and there are righteous. And God only aligns God's self with those good and wonderful things. Why does hell and eternal damnation have to be the way that God deals with those things? Like if God is all powerful, why would God choose such a simplified, um, you know, unfair in my mind mechanism to, to restore 
balance and wholeness to the world. And I think Jesus was much more concerned with how we experience heaven and hell on earth than he was about what happens after we die. I don't think that hell doesn't exist. I mean, it, we create hell for ourselves and others all the time. It's not that the afterlife is something somewhere else. It is here. It's just our ability to see it fully as it is, is limited. I kind of think that like racial injustice is hell and poverty is hell and violence is hell and homophobia is hell. Well, you know, that's hell enough for me. <laughs> when you look at the concept of hell, that it's really irrational to believe if God made us out of themselves, why would God choose to punish a part of himself? It just doesn't make any sense. I can't believe in a God that hates themselves. It just... That's not a God worth worshiping. That's not a God worthy of praise. The issue is that we can't be for sure. We can't be sure if any of those are correct. And so it could be the worst case scenario. It could also be the best case scenario. Um, and we have to be, I guess we have to kind of explore those thoughts for ourselves, figure it out, and then try to find our own, our own way. Um, because, you know, it, it's, like I said, it's a mysterious thing. We can't, we really can't know until we get there. <laughs> what makes you think that you would go to hell? What, what are the things around you that are teaching you about this hell? Or what are those things that are bringing that fear into your life? What are those things that you think you'd, you've done wrong to hurt yourself or others? What are those things that that make you feel bad about yourself, or or that you you are living a, a bad life? Are you living a good life? I had a conversation not too long ago with somebody who was dying and expressed some concern about you know like what if I've been wrong what if you know what if what if you know this is the end and it's the great reckoning and you know what if I go the wrong way and so I said to you, you know tell me about God what do you what do you know about God what do you believe about God is is God mean is God loving does God love you does, you know and, and they were like oh no I know I, I think God loves me okay I said, is God a vengeful God, a forgiving God? Like, talk to me about God. And so this person was just talking about this God that they knew and had believed in. And so, well, you know, I, I think that God cares about us and loves us and wants what's best for us. And, you know, just sort of talked about this God that, that they knew. And I said, so tell me, would that God send, send you to hell? I said, no, I, I don't think they would. I just believe that after death, the, the universe is so infinite and, and the divine is so infinite that there's nothing to worry about uh, if I really believe that the divine is love. If there is anything true about Christianity, it is simply this, that God loves us. God loves us. God loves us so much that God shows God's face to us in Jesus. And Jesus didn't condemn people. Jesus loved people. Jesus didn't exclude people. Jesus welcomed people. In fact, he got a lot of trouble for doing that. If this is already as bad as it's going to get, if this is the scariest part already, and you're still here, where are the holes where the light gets in? And if there are holes where the light gets in, it's not a complete absence of light anymore. There is no darkness, no real, true, unending, eternal darkness. Because the light always gets in somewhere. 